We don't need more crazy if we can help it. with the Chirp YouTube channel. Here we are for another video in our series on autism and addressing the core deficits that exist in an autism spectrum disorder. Today we're going to talk about what to do when kids line stuff up or other repetitive behaviors that we don't know what to do with. These are very common in kids with autism. In fact, so common that they are a core deficit. They're considered a diagnostic criteria when it comes to an autism spectrum disorder. Lining things up and being very rigid about how things are lined up is something that we need to address because, not because lining stuff up in itself is such a bad thing, but because the rigidity of things needing to be lined up and I can't function if they're not in the right order or if someone puts a block next to a yellow block because yellow blocks always have an empty space after them. That sort of rigidity leads to social problems and social deficits are the main problem in autism because without social relationships kids don't learn. They tend to stay inward focused without external stimulation that entrances them and pulls them into the social world. So we need to figure out ways that we can be the fancy magic ones who make social interaction fun. How can you do that, you ask, when my child thinks that the most fun thing in the world is to line up all of his Hot Wheels into a long snake that snakes throughout the living room. And if I move one or the dog pushes one out of place, there's a huge meltdown. How can I make that less fun than me? Well, the trick is that we get involved in the kid's favorite activity. We don't try to convince the kid out of his favorite activity. We insert ourselves in, gently and a little bit at a time. Let's say well, I have some stories about this, a lot of stories about this actually, because autism is my specialty in the field of speech language pathology. Early intervention autism is where I've spent a good amount of time working with kids who are mostly nonverbal. However, one of my very favorite students I ever worked with was the most rigid kid I've ever met. He liked to reenact Thomas, the tank engine videos that he had seen. He had almost all of the toys on this huge table that had bridges and fake little lakes and mountains and all sorts of fun stuff for Thomas lovers. And he would reenact particular scenes that he found the most amusing. His favorite was where, I can't remember if it was Thomas or Percy, someone was dangling off the end of a track that had broken off. He'd dangle him off the table, and then Thomas, I think, would come bravely charging in, hook on, and pull him to safety. Always exactly the same words were said. Always exactly the same routine occurred over and over and over and over. This is not free play. This is not imaginative play. This is reenacting a script and it's not super healthy for kids to do that over and over and over because their, their brain, did you know that when you do something, your brain builds a pathway? And the more times you do the same thing, that pathway gets strengthened. So from neuron A to neuron B, let's say, this is simplified of course, because we're not neuroscientists here, but that pathway gets stronger every time neuron A talks to neuron B. That's how we build habits. That's how come you can drive home on autopilot sometimes and have no idea how you got in your driveway and not remember driving by that McDonald's that you always drive by. That's how a pattern is developed. Your brain just does what it knows how to do. And if our kid is constantly repeating the same activity, 
that pathway is getting very strong, but it becomes harder and harder for the child to break free of that pattern and do anything else. And play, by its nature, is flexible. We want our kids to be able to be flexible when they're interacting with other kids. And in fact, playing with toys by themselves, we want them to be able to be flexible. So this kind of repetition is not healthy play. So when I am in a session with a kid and I notice that he's done the exact same thing two times, three times, that is the end of that thing happening exactly that same way, I'm gonna mess with it. So the first step is that we wanna join the child in whatever that repetitive behavior is. If it's lining up cars, then I'm gonna line up cars too. If it's dangling Thomas off the bridge, then I'm gonna pick a train and I'm gonna dangle him off the bridge too and I'm going to treat the child as my teacher in how we do this activity. And I'm gonna really enjoy it. At least you're gonna see in my face that I am really enjoying this. It's super fun. I'm glad to be playing with this kid and I'm glad to be playing exactly this way. That is the first step in my particular situation with my little friend. He threw a huge fit for weeks every time I touched a train. So I would just, for a little while, I just had my hand on his table and he could handle that. But any more than that and it would be a meltdown. That one's gonna have to be all done. <laughs> I mean, this was a kid who would throw himself on the floor, kicking and screaming, and he would scream for hours. So his parents were terrified to do anything that might put him into this state. But I wasn't because he needed to become more flexible. And so we needed to push things a bit. And sometimes that seems terrifying, but it gets better. And he got better very quickly because we weren't gonna let his behavior affect us the way that he wanted it to. We had to work really hard and it was very loud sometimes, but it worked and it does work. And so I wanna encourage you to keep on trying. For a while, I just talked to him. I asked him questions about what he was doing. He was verbal and pretty smart. And so he would tell me, the script from the video. He would tell me which video it was from after a while I knew. And then he would tell me the names of the different engines involved. He would, I would ask him questions about other things too while this play was going on. And my hand was able to move from just the side of the table onto the pile of trains. And if he went, He'd start sort of ramping up and getting real tense and making funny noises and I'd go oh oh sorry and then I take my hand back but then I'd sneak it back eventually it was okay for my hand to lie on the train pile and then eventually it was okay for me to actually touch a train and hold a train I wasn't yet to the point where I could actually do what he was doing with his engines but I was able to touch one and hold it and then eventually I was able to start imitating what he was doing with his trains. It was a long process, I will be honest with you. It wasn't years long, but it was weeks long, potentially months long, but I was only there once a week. So if you're there every day, you can take things a little bit faster than that. There's always a push and pull sort of situation in these sensitive kids because if we don't have to, we don't want them to get to that tantrum point. We want to play the edge. So you want to push them enough that it's slightly uncomfortable, but not so much that you are the enemy and they never want to see you again. That doesn't work so well. The best plan is to find a place that's uncomfortable. Initially, I was just touching the table and he was not happy about that, but it was acceptable. And when that became not a big deal at all, I had to sort of increase things. And so I had to put my hand on the pile of trains. And that was very uncomfortable. 
but after a while it wasn't such a big deal. I never actually stopped him from doing his favorite things. I didn't I, I didn't mess with him so much that he thought I was a threat at that point. And the goal of this, it's kind of like exposure therapy with kids who are oversensitive in their sensory system. I have a video on that right up there that you can watch should you wish to. It is basically retraining the kid's amygdala which is a part inside your brain that responds to a threat. And some kids are very oversensitive to the sense of being under threat, that they are threatened by something. He was threatened by me touching his train table. That is unusual. That's, it shouldn't be a threat, but for his brain, it was. And so we had to work very slowly but consistently to help his brain realize that me touching his table, me touching his trains, me sitting next to him on the bench, these things are not threats. I'm not a threat. I'm not gonna steal your trains. I'm not going to harm you. I'm here to have fun. And other people are there to have fun too. So we're retraining the kids' brains in a very play-based way but a very well thought out and scientific way also. So that is the first step. Get involved in what the child is doing. If your child is lining stuff up, your first step is probably to have a different group of items. So don't take the child's Hot Wheels, his favorite ones anyway, and you know line those up in your own area. Don't jump in and try to add your cars to his line immediately. Perhaps you have some cars that he doesn't like all that much and you line those up in a separate line. If that is acceptable, then you go to the next step and you use the same toys that the kid is using. So he might put a car down and then you might put a car down or you might put two cars down and then he puts a car down. So then you're playing with the same toys and that is fun. Once again, we're playing the edge here. We don't want to push so hard that you're not fun anymore. Sometimes that will happen. We just bring ourselves back, let the kid calm down, and we try again. Don't be afraid to push a little bit, but when you notice that tension building in the kid, so maybe his voice gets really high, maybe he gets a weird face, maybe he gets really stiff, maybe his eyes get kind of crazy. If you notice those signs of tension building, back off. Let the kid calm down and then start up again with just a little bit of pushing here and there. We're not doing this all day long. We're doing this in short stints. So maybe you have two or three play times a day, if you can, when your kid is really little, um, where you kind of work on nudging those boundaries. After you've been able to get involved in the kid's behavior, the second step is you want to gently shape that behavior toward being more social, more interactive. In the case of my friend, my next step after I was able to play trains with him was intervening somehow in his desired routine with the train dangling off the bridge. So I tried to say, I tried to take a different train that wasn't supposed to rescue him and say, I'll save him. And I'd quick jump in and pull him to safety. And that was not acceptable at first. No, no, Thomas does it. <laughs> that was a big problem, but you know, I attempted it. And then I stood by at the bottom and pretended I would catch him if he fell. And then I brought a helicopter and said, if you need my help, I'm right here. I can pull him to safety. I got involved in as many ways as I could without pushing the kid over into crazy territory. Because we don't need more crazy if we can help it. Poor Edward is stuck. What are we gonna do? Edward, who's gonna save you if you fall off the edge? Who will save you? Will Emily save you? <gasps> don't fall, Edward! You fall me in He's gonna fall off the track. The track is all finished. It ends right there. We need a stop sign. He fell 
fall. I'm going to put the police car. He says, Woo! Don't fall off the track, Edward! Woo! What happened? Yeah! What happened? Oh no! We need to save the police car! Clarabelle says, Don't worry, I'll come and save you! Yeah! No! I will save you, police car! Yeah! I will save you, That's right! Okay, let's go back up. Back up the mountain. Let's drive up the side. Hey, drive up the leg. <laughs> Yay! The police car says, Thank you for saving me, Clarabelle. You're a good friend. Eventually, we were able to evolve into more flexible play and more social play so our trains could talk to each other and it wasn't very long after I was able to sort of insert myself into this play routine that he didn't actually need that play routine so much anymore the other play activities that we were doing with the trains was fun enough and not threatening so that we were able to play trains together like trains should be played we could have races, we could talk to each other and decide who our favorite engine was, we could talk about Sir Topham Hat. It was more of a natural play sort of experience for both of us, rather than reenacting something from a movie, which is not actually play. So that is your next step you need to push things a little bit to make them more social. In the case of lining up Hot Wheels, let's see, how could we do this? First, you could change the pattern. If your kid does his Hot Wheels in a rainbow pattern, then you could put a blue car in with the red cars. Of course, as soon as your kid starts getting tense, you say, oops, that's wrong, that's a blue car. He goes with the blue cars. You solve the problem. You defuse the tension by saying, whoops, that's not what I meant. Let me move that. And you get the pattern back to how it was. But you're pushing a little bit. The second thing you could change is you could do something at a different speed. If your child lines up the cars very slowly and deliberately, you could take all yours in your hands and go and lay them all out really quickly and then say, and make it like a speed game. So that's also messing with the pattern just a little bit, but it's fun. Another thing you could do that messes a little bit, but not too much, is by bringing in another toy altogether. Maybe you bring in some blocks and you line them up at the same distance from each other as his cars. That would be very interesting. Another option is that you could ask your child what you should do next. So if you have, let's say he's only lining up black cars. Only black cars, that's his thing. He lines up the black ones. Then you could say, which one should be next? Yellow or purple? And you could ask him which one goes next. He may see, no, neither one of those. <laughs> he may just push you away. And then you can say, okay, purple and put the purple one there. Usually with kids who line stuff up, if you put something in their pattern that doesn't fit there, they'll just throw it away. <laughs> Get rid of that because it doesn't belong there. But you just keep trying and eventually it becomes kind of a game. So if I keep all the yellow cars, he only lines up the black one, but I gather all sorts of yellow cars and then he puts some down and when he's looking for his next one, I sneak a yellow one in it. Then I smirk at him. First, he will probably pick it up and throw it, maybe at me. But if I do this enough times and it doesn't totally push him over the edge, I'm watching his signals this whole time. If it doesn't push him over the edge, then eventually he's probably going to laugh. And he may still move it, but it will be fun instead of quite so rigid. And that's what we're looking for. We want interactive, social fun that is not rigid and obsessive. Rigid and obsessive is not fun. And in fact, the kid isn't actually having fun. He's just calming down his anxiety by doing something over and over that helps his body feel calm, that regulates that amygdala activity a bit. But we can regulate that activity in the amygdala 
by social interaction as well. We can help each other regulate ourselves because we're having fun together. That's what social interaction is meant for. And our kids are missing out on it, so we don't want them to. We want to add more of that to their lives as much as possible. I hope this video gave you some things to think about for your kid who may have some rigid behaviors, who may line stuff up, who may act out scenes from a TV show over and over and over. Now you have some ideas about how to break through that rigid bubble and build some more social time with your kid or your students or your clients. I will leave more information about this topic down below in the info box as always. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Please ding the notification bell and subscribe if you haven't already. Not so much for my sake, but for the sake of those other families and professionals out there who also need this kind of information because it's kind of hard to find sometimes. I hope you have a great day. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.